So we're getting into dot product. <clears throat> what was the product we did back in 12.2? There was some product we did. So we did a scalar product, which the reason you call something a product, we have our algebraic properties. I'm going to circle the properties that give us a proper product. The reason you call it a product is the distributive property. It actually had two distributive properties depending on which you were multiplying right here, but these properties here are why we call it a product because of the way it interacts with addition. So we're about to look at dot product and then afterwards cross product and both of them are gonna have the distributive property. Now I circled two or box two distributive formulas here. In this first one, we're taking a scalar and uh, distributing a sum of a scalar to a vector. In the second one, we're taking the sum of two vectors and distributing it to a scalar. But it works the same, a very similar way algebraically. So let's go to the dot product section. We'll start with the definition. So we're going to take a U and a V and this can happen in N dimensions. So it can happen in two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions. We're not in this class going to go past three dimensions usually, almost never four dimensions, but this goes in any dimensional space you're in. And the notation we use is a dot, hence the name dot product and we dot two vectors together, it's the same as, well, if I write out the summation formula, k equals one to n, u k v k, where u is u one, u two, u n, and then V was V1, V2, Vn. So right here we have UK, VK. That's the kth coordinate of the U vector times the kth coordinate of the V vector. So you're just multiplying corresponding coordinates together. And what does this sigma mean? We just saw at the beginning of the quarter. That's a summation. So you're adding together all those products as you go. So we'll do an example here where we'll do a dot product. <clears throat> so the vector u, I'm going to use ijk notation. So this will be negative one half i plus three k. And vector v is going to be four i minus two j plus K. Now I personally like diamond notation a lot better. So I'm going to rewrite this in diamond notation. What coordinate is not written down for the U vector? So we got J coordinates not written down. It has a J coordinate, but the J coordinate is zero. So if you're using IJ notation, IJK notation, just be very careful because if you have a zero coordinate, it won't actually appear. It'll look like it only has two coordinates. Uh, the reason I knew we were in three dimensions is because the vector V had I, J, K coordinates. So it had three coordinates. All right, when they're written out like this, you can do the dot product very easily. What I like to do is just look and group up I'm multiplying basically columns right here. So I'm just multiplying the X column and then I'm gonna multiply the Y column and then the Z column. So we have negative one half times four plus zero plus three times one. So I'm just going column by column here. And that's negative two plus zero plus three, which is one. So this first example we have one is a dot product. When you take a dot product, you're taking two vectors and you're going to get a scalar. So it's a little strange because what you get after you take your product is something different than 
your operands. So your t input is two vectors, output is a number. So now we're going to look at the angle between two vectors. So before we write the formula out, let's think about what this actually is uh, referring to. So if I just draw two vectors, what we need to do to think about the angle between them is have them start at the same point. So I'm just going to take that vector and slide it over so they start at the same point, And then the angle between them we'll call theta right here. So I drew them obviously on a two-dimensional plane. But if you take uh, any of your two fingers, and I'm just taking the middle and the pointer finger, make sure they're not directly next to each other, but spread them apart a little bit like the peace sign. And you can kind of move them around a little bit, but it doesn't matter if you hold your finger steady and move your wrist, you can kind of point them any direction and your angle is still the same. So however you move your fingers, it's the angle between the two vectors. It doesn't matter their orientation, only the angle with respect to the other vector. So that's the angle we're finding right here. Back in trigonometry class, our first vector was the x-axis, and our second vector was the one on the unit circle. So our first vector was always a positive x-axis, and then the second vector originated from the origin and pointed somewhere on the unit circle. Now the vectors can be anywhere, and we're just looking at the angle between them. All right, the formula <coughs> is going to, we need two vectors, u and v. And our formula would be cosine theta equals u dot v divided by magnitude u times the magnitude of v. And if I want to solve for theta, I have to move the cosine function to the other side as the inverse function. So I can solve for theta pretty easily. And we get cos inverse u dot v divided by magnitude u magnitude v. So let's think about the cosine inverse function. You only get a very small range output from the cosine inverse. And without going through all the details, cos inverse, the range is angles between zero and pi right here. So if you take your fingers and if they're parallel, your angle is zero. So there is the angle between them. If your vectors are parallel, they're going the same direction. There is, the angle between them is zero. You probably can't make an angle of pi with your fingers. You can probably go a little past maybe pi over two. But if you think about the maximum angle is pi. So I'll draw the two vectors with the maximum angle of pi right here. And there's our angle pi. I could move one of these vectors a little further and you might think, oh, look, the angle is bigger than pi. But what way would we actually be measuring the angle? We'll measure it on the smaller direction right there. So it looks like you're making the angle bigger, but the way that this actually measures the angle would be that smaller angle right there. So once you go past pi, it counts It's the smaller angle between the two vectors. So any two vectors, you could measure the big angle, but the formula that's on the board always measures the smaller angle between the two vectors. Does that make sense? It's always the short angle or small angle between two vectors. So let's find the angle between two vectors. So this is our next example. So our vector u will be negative 1 half, 0, 3. Is it the same? Yeah, we'll do the same two vectors as before. v is going to be 4, negative 2, 1. All right, so find the angle between these two vectors. We already got the dot products. What you just need to do is get the magnitudes and then divide it out and then solve for theta.
any questions on that computation? Why is there a two on top? So I took that fraction and reciprocated it, multiplied by the reciprocal, and that two is the square root of four. You should always be careful when I'm using numbers, high chance of mistakes. So we're gonna look, <coughs> we already looked at parallel. So let's think about parallel and anti-parallel with our angle, and then we're gonna look at perpendicular with our angle. So parallel meant they point the same direction. What would our angle be if we had parallel? So we have zero if we're parallel. And coat zero is one. So u dot v. This would be an incredibly tedious and slow way to figure out two vectors are parallel. To take the dot product, then divide by each of the magnitudes, and if it all reduces to one, you're parallel. So here's the worst way to determine your parallel. How do we determine parallel much, much more quickly? Yeah, two vectors are multiples. If they're positive multiples of each other, then you have parallel. So I strongly recommend you don't use the formula I just wrote on the board. This is the worst way to determine their parallel. It takes forever. So u is parallel to v exactly when there exists alpha greater than zero such that uh, u equals alpha v. That's what we saw back when we did the scalar product. That was how to determine their parallel. So that was parallel. So this is horrible, ugly formula. So ugly formula to determine uh, parallel. All right, anti-parallel, there's not a really nice symbol for it, so I'll just make one up. How about that? Really anti-parallel means there will get perpendicular next, but this is pointing opposite directions. So what did we look at? What formula did we get when we were using scalar multiplication? What property did alpha have to have? It had to be negative. So it's the same, except now alpha was less than zero, such that u equals alpha v. So they're still scalar multiples, they're just negatives of each other. So they're pointing opposite directions. And without going through all the work, our angle would be pi, like we looked at before. Cos pi is negative one. So our really ugly formula would be negative one equals u dot v divided by magnitude u, magnitude v. So that's the uh, worst formula for anti-parallel right there. So use the easy one, the scalar multiple formula. All right, there is an angle that works really well with cosine. So if we have perpendicular, well, I'm gonna use the word orthogonal first. AKA perpendicular. So that is two vectors have a right angle, which of course is pi over two. And cos pi over two is zero. So cosine is a much nicer value at pi over two. And if we set up that cos pi over two equals magnitude u, or uh, u dot v divided by magnitude u, magnitude v. So none of what I'm writing down makes sense if the magnitudes are zero. So your magnitudes can't be zero here. Uh, 
So we have zero equals u dot v. So if a fraction equals zero, that means the numerator is zero. So we're going to detect if two vectors are orthogonal if their dot product is zero. So that's a much faster formula for determining their orthogonal. So this is one that should make it on your cheat sheet. If the dot product is zero, then u is orthogonal to v. And our orthogonal symbol is upside down t. So instead of just deciding if two vectors are orthogonal or not, what we're going to do, we're going to start with one vector, and I want you to figure out all vectors that are orthogonal to this vector. So we'll take v to be the vector 1, 1, 0. So it's in three dimensions. You could graph it out if that helps. It doesn't really matter how you graph it out. So I'll just pretend it looks like that right there. And I want to know all vectors that, or, that are orthogonal. So I, have, I saw that orthogonal formula on the board. But what I need to do is think about we're in three dimensions. So in three dimensions, any vector is going to have three coordinates. So I'm going to start out with let u be a vector in R3. So that's how we write that out. u is an element of R3. So what that means is u has three coordinates. I could go x, y, z. I'll just go a, b, c. You can use any three letters you want. Don't use v, u and v. But any, and try to avoid d because we're in calculus class, so d really usually means derivative. All right. So what I want you to do right now is figure out all a, b, and c values that satisfy that property at the top of the board, the dot product being 0. So do that right now. So all I have to do is dot product these together, set it equal to zero, and then describe in words or set notation what types of ABC values have this property here. Got any questions? It's a good time to ask them. So I saw most of you got a plus b equals 0 or a equals negative b, however you want to write that relationship. All right, so first of all, what about c? Does c have any impact on these being uh, orthogonal? So c could be anything. If we use linear algebra description, c is a free variable because c doesn't affect this equation being true or false. 
and you can now choose whatever you want for B, and then A is negative that. So B is free, and then A is negative B. So you can choose any C value, any B value, and then A, whatever you chose for B, A is negative that value. So if we write it in vector form, there's a few ways to write this out. So I'll take any S and T in R. So take any two real numbers you want. And if I put in S for the X or the B coordinate, negative S has to be in the first coordinate position. So whatever I put in for B, I put the negative that in for A. And then the C coordinate, the Z coordinate can be anything, so that's why I picked the second letter T to represent that third coordinate. Uh, we don't want these to be zero, so we also have to write such that. There's a few ways to write S S can equal zero as long as T is not zero, and T can equal zero as long as X, S is not zero. There's a fast way to mathematically write that. The, the product doesn't equal zero. That means the only way you get a product to equal zero uh, is if one or both are zero. So if the product's not zero, that means neither are zero. So that's a fast way to write both of them not zero right there. So that is uh, a pretty relatively easy way to write out that uh, these. If we just turn this into set builder notation, you pretty much write the same thing. So you write what your elements look like, and then you write a vertical bar, which means such that. So these are this is the element structure or form. And then the vertical bar means such that. Sometimes you see a colon in between. And then I'm going to write the properties over here, such that the only real property, I'll just say st or any real number, and st not 0. If you want to write out even more stuff, you could write it a, B, C, such that A equals negative B, A, B, and C are real numbers, and B, C are not zero, B, C not equal to zero. Uh, I like to write it in the upper form, it's just less writing than the lower one. But I would take either of these two to be the correct way to describe all vectors. So now we'll look at the algebraic properties of the dot product. So here, the, algebraically, the important word is product, which means it's going to distribute across addition. So we'll start out with the commutative property u dot v equals v dot u. And if you think about where the dot product, where we defined it, you're just going to multiply each coordinate the other order. So I'll scroll up for a second. Probably the example will be a little bit better that we computed. All you'll be doing is reversing the order you're multiplying right here, which of course, one times three is three times one, negative one half times four is four times negative a half. So that's where you get commutativity. And <clears throat> we'll do the distributive property next. So here we're going to distribute across the dot product across the sum. So this is u dot v plus u dot w. So 
So how do you know the zero in the dot product is a vector? It's bold. It's bold. And if I was forgetful and wrote it as a regular zero, how would you know it's still a vector? Because it only makes sense in a dot product to take dot product of a vector with a vector. I'm going to try to not be ambiguous when I write zero vector versus zero number, so I'll keep it bold like this. So we can do scalar multiplication two. So alpha u dot v, you can move the scalar around. So you can write this as u dot alpha v. You can also factor the alpha outside and do the dot product first and then the multiply by alpha at the end. And last up, a dot product with a vector dot producting with itself is the magnitude squared because a dot product you're just multiplying the first coordinates same as squaring the first coordinate then you're multiplying the second coordinates the same as squaring the second coordinates etc cetera, etc cetera. the only thing missing on the magnitude is the square root so it's the magnitude squared so the last <coughs> Last thing we look at is work. We're going to need projections as well. It's not in my notes, but I'll add it in. All right, we'll do projection. So this is going to be one vector projecting on another vector. And the best way to think about projection, it's really a shadow. So it's a shadow cast by one vector onto another. Now, where's the light source? I'll use orange. Ooh, let's use yellow. Let's see how yellow shows up. All right, when we do projections, the rays of sun are perpendicular to the ground, which is flat. So the sun is not a sphere. The sun's an infinitely wide line or plane and all of the sun rays are parallel hitting the ground which is also flat. So again, not the best representation of what actually happens, but good enough for what we're doing. Oh, does it look like orange? I guess it's the sunset for you, but it's definitely yellow on this screen. The sun ray that's important is the one that hits the end of the vector that's casting a shadow. So I'm not going to draw an arrow at the bottom of this vector. What I'm going to draw instead is a right angle because that's where the sun ray is hitting the ground. Like that. Now we'll zoom in and give all these labels. So this first vector I will call, I'll call the first, ve first vector U. The big vector will be V. And there's going to be two other vectors I'm interested in. The first vector, the first shadow vector that I drew in blue. What it is, is a. in this picture I drew, it's a shorter version of V, but I'm gonna draw a different uh, configuration where it could be a longer vector than V, and I'll draw another example where it'll actually be a negative multiple of V. So we use the, we're lazy, so we'll just write pro J for projection. So projection of u onto v. So I write it with a subscript. The vector I'm projecting onto is down below, and the vector casting the shadow is above, like this. So it's very much written kind of like a logarithm with a base. It's just a different function. We're going to figure out the trigonometry to get this projection, mainly because this is not on my notes right here. If I knew about the angle theta right here, I have, so I'm looking at a right triangle. What side do I know about in my right triangle? 
hypotenuse. So that's u is the hypotenuse. And what side do I want to find, adjacent or opposite? I want to find the adjacent. So sine theta equals adjacent, whoa, cosine theta. That's a little better. Cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse. All right. Is the hypotenuse u or magnitude of u? It's going to be the magnitude of u. I'm going to leave the adjacent right here as the magnitude of the projection, which I don't know yet. So before we go on, any questions about the setup that I have here? We're looking at just the lengths of the sides, going back to using the the ka part of Sokotoa. So I have a formula for cosine theta that we just looked at, so I'm going to use that formula right now. The formula is u dot v divided by magnitude u magnitude v And what I want to do is solve for this projection. Solve for that projection. So all I really need to do is multiply by the magnitude of u, which will have the effect of canceling the magnitude of u. So there's the projection, the magnitude of the projection of u onto v, or of u onto v. So looking back to the uh, in the picture I drew here with v and the projection. So first of all, they're parallel. So what does that mean about their scalar multiple? So they're equal, except they're equal up to a scalar multiple. So let's start with that. So projection of u onto v is parallel to v. So that means there is, there is an alpha greater than 0 such that, so such that, I'm going to abbreviate with st. I'm tired of writing such that. So we'll go st. There's an alpha greater than 0 such that I'll write this as alpha v equals projection of u onto v. So now we'll take the magnitude of both sides of this equation. And I can break alpha out of the absolute value, or out of the magnitude with an absolute value. And I'm going to use my projection uh, equation that I've already computed over here. So I'm going to bring that in, u dot v over magnitude v. And I'm going to solve for an alpha we already said was positive, so alpha doesn't need the absolute value. And then I'm going to divide by magnitude of v. So that'll put magnitude of v squared in the denominator. So what we just computed is alpha. And then I'll just rewrite our original equation with this version of alpha in there. So we got projection, and I'll write this in white because this is our formula that we are going to use. So projection of u onto v is alpha, 
which I'm getting at the bottom left. So it's u dot v divided by magnitude v squared. That is alpha times v. So let's take a look at what is a number and what's a vector here. So, well, before we do that, any questions on all those computations we did and the arrows all over the place? So we'll look at, and this should definitely make it on your cheat sheet. So inside the parentheses here, dot product is a number, magnitude is a number. So in the parentheses, it's number divided by number, giving us a number. So this is a scalar multiple of V. So the projection, all it is, is a scalar multiple of V. If you ever see this uh, word scalar product, what's in the parentheses is called the scalar product. No, it can't be a scalar product. There's some special word for it. It's not scalar. I think it's in one of your homework questions. It's some type of product, and if, you're not, if it's not dot product, cross product, or scalar product, it's this product right here. So somewhere in your homework, there's a question about some product that I didn't teach you, and it's just that coefficient right there. So let's look at the situation if the angle is greater than, well, let's think about it. if the angle is exactly pi over 2, what will the projection be? The projection will be the zero vector. Now I'm going to redraw this situation with an angle that's bigger than pi over 2. Well, actually, first, let's see what would happen if this angle u was really big. The, what the projection would become is a larger version of v, because it would cast a shadow beyond the original length. So that would give us a multiple more than 1. Now if our angle is bigger than pi over 2, you still have the sun shining directly above right here. So the projection will actually go the opposite direction of V. So you'll get negative in your dot product when you compute that. So there is one more type of projection you can get. So I'll leave that second one up. All right, the other projection you get, we'll go with a color that's not on here right now. I don't want to use red. Ooh, we're running out of colors that are visible. Is that, is that visible? OK. So this vector right here, if you think about the vector u, we're basically breaking it into two components. One of them is in the v direction, and the other one is in the not v direction, or the orthogonal direction. So one of them tells how much to go in the v direction. The other one tells basically what's left over. What and this second one I drew is called the orthogonal projection, which I will write as the O projection of U onto V. What would I get if I added the two projections together, the projection and the orthogonal? So if I add the amount in the v direction plus the amount not in the v direction, I'll get my original vector u. Can you see that from the picture? You add those two together, and you always add head to tail. So I'll just take that orthogonal vector and move it over so it starts right where the projection ends. And you can see you go across one vector, up the other vector, and you have your vector u right there. So that's how we're going to compute the orthogonal projection. And I'm going to need to write this down, write it below all the work we just did. So u is equal to the orthogonal projection u onto v plus the regular 
projection u onto v. And I want to know what the orthogonal projection is, so we just subtract the other projection. So u minus, oops, u minus projection. I want to switch to white because this is going to be our actual formula. So projection, orthogonal projection, u onto v is u minus the projection u onto v. So I find these hard to remember. They're not super hard to write down, but they're hard to remember, so cheat sheet is the best place for these to go. So we got enough time to write down the example problem, and then we'll solve it tomorrow. Well, before we write down the problem, let's write down the force equation, or the work equation. All right, so in physics, you've hopefully seen work by now. The best way to think about work is a force applied over some distance. Well, I should say along a distance, because over makes me think of division. So our work is going to be the force vector dot the displacement vector. So F is the force applied, and D is the displacement. Now I know this breaks my rule that don't ever use the letter D unless you're talking about derivative, but it's already set in physics, basically, that D is displacement. So we're just going to use it. And the way this works is, let's say you're moving a box along, uh, you're moving a box along the flat ground. If you apply, unless you're sliding it on the ground, and even if you're sliding it, you're probably not applying your force directly parallel to the ground. That would actually take a lot of effort to apply a force exactly parallel to the ground. You're probably either pushing down and forward or kind of lifting and carrying it up and forward. So let's say you're not dragging it, you're lifting and carrying it. You're applying a force that probably looks something like that. You're putting a lot of effort into lifting it and then some effort into moving it forward depending on how heavy the box is or how fast you're moving forward. The way physics counts your work, the physics doesn't care about, and there's two components, one of them is directly up and the other one is the projection forward. When we count the work, all the work going up doesn't count. Only the work going forward if you're moving the box forward. It's different if you're carrying it up upstairs, then your up work counts too but your box is going to go from that position to this position. So your displacement is that vector right there, and the only work that actually counts is the force in the direction you're moving it. So that's why we're gonna use the projection when we compute this.